spirit, you are in this place. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you, oh God, for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that I may decrease and that your spirit, oh God, may increase in me. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is such a privilege and honor to be here with my family, Christ Church. Um, I thank God for my friend and uh, Pastor Monica. I thank God for um, two other friends who are here, Ashley and Aaron, who've come all the way from uh, Maryland and uh, near um, Richmond, the Richmond area. They came far to be here with us this morning. And I just have to thank God for my best friend, Mr. Matthew Aaron, for your constant support. Uh, there is a word from the Lord this morning on this Women's History Month Sunday. And it comes from Exodus chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And it reads, Now a man of a tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it, put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sisters stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. This is the word of the Lord. For just a few moments, this Women History Month Sunday, I will be preaching upon the topic of pleading guilty. All right. Pleading All right. guilty. Amen. In my second life, I believe that I am a private investigator <laughs> because I've watched more criminal cases and shows than I am willing to admit. As a natural problem solver, I find it interesting how people can use clues to solve problems and to bring justice to injustices around the world. I mean, I am no detective, but I do believe that God created women with a sixth sense to detect the truth, amen, somebody. I've learned recently in the court of law, women have transformed the world. In 1852, Susan B. Anthony attended her first woman's right convention and spent many years in court fighting for women, which succeeded in the 19th Amendment and for the right for women to vote. She was guilty of desiring voting equality. Uh -huh. In the famous Brown versus Board Education, it was fighting for the freedom for Linda Brown, who was denied entrance into Topeka's all-white elementary school. She was guilty of wanting to end segregation. Mm -hmm. Clara Shortridge Folks was the first female lawyer in, on the West Coast, and her legacy with the courts allowed her to pioneer the idea of the public defender that we know today. She was guilty of expanding opportunities for future women lawyers. In Bradwell versus Illinois, the Supreme Court of Illinois refused to grant a woman a license to practice law on the ground that women were not eligible in the state law. Mrs. Bradwell was guilty of wanting equal professional opportunities. To plead guilty instantly comes with a sentence and fear of having to do jail time. It admits that a crime of some nature has been committed. But if there is an inequality, unfair treatment, and a person stands up for their rights, being guilty of paving a way for others, guilty of challenging systems, guilty of wanting fair wages, the right to vote, the right to marry, the right to work, then sign women up guilty as charged. Amen. If being guilty means that your DNA and Fingerprints will be found on the scenes of serving the poor, praying for unbelievers, pulling up the next generation, helping 
our brothers and sisters in need, if your fingerprints will be found on the hearts of the brokenhearted and the forgotten, then yes, those fingerprints are indeed mine. And society is not going to intimidate me from pleading guilty of following Jesus in a society that will rather follow one another. Amen, somebody. And on this Women's Month, uh, History Month Sunday, I want to remind all of the women and the men before us, not on our watch. I want us to be reminded that you are not going to have our children, that you are not going to have our faith and our church. You are not going to have our minds. You are not going to have unbelievers. You are not going to pay us less So overlook our work. You are going to give us equality because we are sons and daughters of Christ and we will do whatever it takes to be guilty of wanting justice. All right, all right. Do you know who you are this morning? All right. You are a daughter and son of Christ. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are more than a conqueror. You are the head and not the tail. You are a prayer warrior. You are generational curse breakers and I refuse to stay silent in the court of faith. And I just came this morning to give God praise for all of the men and women guilty of holy boldness this morning. Uh, during the times of this text, Pharaoh was over Egypt and asked for all of the Hebrew women to kill their boys at birth. He feared that they would overpopulate Egypt, becoming more powerful, and he wanted to keep the population down. And so in order to do this, he mandated that it be illegal for women to keep their sons alive. Moses' mother being the strong and dedicated mother she is, having given birth to Moses' older siblings, Aaron and Miriam, she knew that in order to keep her third child alive, she had to disobey the law. Right. So she was guilty of choosing God over Pharaoh. Uh, guilty of allowing Moses to live despite the decree. Guilty of being a mother of a man who will lead the people from Egypt into the promised land. Guilty of worshiping the one true God, not the earthly Pharaoh. Guilty of all charges. And I just came here this morning because we have some fearless people in this church and we have some fearless people who are watching online that are not here to worship status and not here to worship titles, but to be guilty of worshiping our God, guilty of praising our way through pain, guilty of giving God glory even when your back is against the wall, guilty of trusting God through the uncertainties of your life. And Moses' mother said, if being obedient to my God makes me defend the law of Jesus and not the law of the world. And I'm going to do whatever it takes so that God can get glory from my seed this morning. And so the first thing that I want us to understand is when you are pleading guilty in the court of faith, you first have to be reminded of your origin. Be reminded of who you are and what God has created you to be since your inception. Uh, you have to understand, church, that there were 12 tribes of Israel. The tribe of Levi is set apart and was instructed to live in the city area surrounding the tabernacle. They were in charge of taking care of God's dwelling place. They were priest, priestly. Come on, Holy Spirit. They were priestly. The Levites were descendants of Levi, who was described as a man who did not play. He would fight and go to war with men who caused injustices in the world. He actually was quoted in scripture of having killed a man who took advantage of his sister and then went on to attack the entire city. Levi had a desire for righteousness, for justice, and came 
against sin. So Moses' mother and father are descendants of a man who led a tribe and stood up against injustices in the world. They had the DNA of a man who was unafraid to go to war and to uphold the holiness of God. So when the scriptures mentions that his father was a Levi and his mother was a Levi, it was in their DNA to be pioneers for justice and to uphold the desires of God over Pharaoh, even if they were convicted of breaking the law. They were connected to warriors and their origin was to fight for what is right. It is time for women and men to be reminded of where we have come from. Inside your DNA is royalty. You come from a lineage of strong women. Your DNA breaks generational curses. Your family have navigated wildernesses over the years. Your DNA has the authority to rewrite history. So when the Pharaoh of your life tries to come to steal, kill, and destroy, you have to be reminded that you were born to not back down and that it is impossible for you to be defeated because in your lineage you are victorious in your lineage you are more than conquerors amen somebody so the question that I have this morning is what is your origin in times of turmoil or sickness or devastation or rejection what does your origin have to say about it? What does your faith and your God have to say about it? Because in the times of injustices, we have to be reminded of who we are. And so Moses knew that she came from a tribe who would back up her strength. And even furthermore, her name was Jokovet. Her name was Jokovet whose Hebrew meaning means Yahweh is glory. It was in her DNA to live a life that would give God glory. Because before she was in her mother's womb, God knew that her seed would be the one to set people free and give God glory. That her son would give God glory and that her defeating Pharaoh would give God glory. And so we have to be reminded this morning, church, that our DNA leads to the victory in Christ. That we were not created to just be people that will follow Pharaoh, but be people that stand up for God. And I see women before me this morning, trailblazing leaders and people who are praying for generations. I see before me this morning daughters who have testimonies down on the inside of you that had it not been for the Lord on your side, you don't know where you will be. I see people before me this morning that says, I am not going to back down, but I'm going to rise up. I'm going to rise up and demand healing. I'm going to rise up and demand boldness. I am going to rise up and demand that my legacy come forth. I will write that book. I will start that business. I will lead that community in your DNA. You were born to be resilient. You were born to shake up some things in this world. You were born to bring people back to the kingdom of of God. Amen. So when you know who and whose you are, you will be boldly gifted, guilty of showing the Pharaoh in your life mm. that it will not be more powerful than your God. When you know who God has created you to be, you can silence the voice of the enemy saying, you will not speak louder than the promises of God over my life. What is your origin this morning, church. And so after you realize that you have unique fingerprints, that your DNA was meant to be used for the kingdom of God, you must then in the court of faith be guilty of out-strategizing the enemy. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, Upon his departure, he was approached by the enemy. 
And of the many tactics that the enemy could have used, he was found to be misquoting scripture. Jesus, knowing the word of God, knew that it was taken out of context and responded to the enemy's misquoted scripture by quoting a scripture of his own. Ladies, this morning, you have to understand that the enemy knows the word just like we do. He knows and studies each and every one of us too. He knows what will rock your faith. He knows what will get you out of your character. He knows what will make you question your God. But the Bible says that he is the prince of lies. And so uh, Jochebed knew that the Nile River was long. She knew, in fact, that it was the longest river in the world. She knew that it led to many bodies of water, and she did not really want to lose her son. So she was also aware of a particular route that would cause him to have slowness down the river. She was a woman of strategy. She knew that the enemy was talking and God downloaded down on the inside of her a different way. And so while Pharaoh had a strategy of how he would kill the sons, God gave her a strategy of how she would keep him alive. All right. Scripture reminds us that when she saw that the child was fine, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got him into a papyrus basket for him and she coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed it into the river along the reeds of the bank. Papyrus is a plant that is highly buoyant in the water. It is durable and during these times it was this plant that they used to make boats to travel down the water. And so when she used this plant, she then put tar and pitch around it to make sure that it would not have water to come inside of the holes. She was a woman of strategy. She then strategically placed him not in the major route of the river, but she sent him along the reeds of the Nile. Christ church, the reeds were also described as bulrushes. Where areas where the water is not as deep and it was filled with mud. So this allowed for the basket to go down the river at a slower pace. Are you with me this morning? She strategically placed Moses among the marshes, knowing that this was also near the place where Pharaoh's daughter would bathe with her servants. She had strategy and precision. All right. How are you going to out-strategize the enemy in your life? Somebody is about to pray like never before. Maybe you are about to get in your word and be reminded of the promises of God. Uh, somebody is about to open up their mouth and ask for help. Right. Mary had strategy. Ruth had strategy. Hannah had strategy. Rosa Parks and Harriet had strategy. Mother yes. Teresa and Helen Keller had strategy. Your mothers and your praying great grandmothers had strategy. And when you realize and you strategize with the Lord, there is not a fair fight because because God is the ultimate strategist. He will make your crooked path straight. He will be a lamp unto your feet and a light upon your path. The word says that God will fight for you if only you be still. That a thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. But it will not come near you. Do not throw in the towel this morning. Church, get strategy. Do not surrender and be defeated. Get strategy. Right. Do not give them a piece of your mind. Do not seek revenge. Do not fight with your words. You have to out-strategize your Pharaoh. Pray your way through praise. Your way through speak. Your way through walk. Run, but crawl your way through. Do not let the enemy out-strategize you with defeat. And if you're watching online, type in the chat, I am guilty of strategy. Right. This time I'm going to fast and pray about it. This time I'm going 
going to hold my tongue this time. I'm going to walk away. I can't respond to that text right now. I got to pray about it first. I need strategy. I have to see what God has to say. I have to see how God wants me to move. Do I need to go left? Do I need to turn around? But I'm not going to take a step until I strategize with the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who sits on the throne with all power in his hand. It is time for us to get ahead of the enemy because he knows what will get us off course. He knows what will back us into a corner. But when you consult with God, God will give you the words. God will give you the path. God will give you the boldness to strategize his way. And not the way of the world. Amen, somebody. Yeah. We have to strategize the right way. We have to use the right weapons in the right season with the right God. Yeah. And so lastly, as we are in the court of faith, you must be guilty of raising up the next generation. Amen. After Jochebed placed the basket in the river, it did not say that his mother continued to watch. And that tells me right there that she had faith in the strategy that God had given her. That's a word for somebody because sometimes God gives us a word. God gives us that answer and we're questioning. We're turning around. We are second guessing. But when God gives you strategy, you have to be like Moses' mother and walk away and say, it's in God's hand. I know that it's going to work out. I know that it's going to turn out exactly how God see fit because I trust the directions of God. And so instead of second guessing, she used her energy and her power to raise up the next generation. In verse 4, it states, Moses' sister stood at a distance. To see what would happen to him. His sister was Miriam. One who will watch him not only during this time. But she will watch over him as he led the people out of the wilderness. Jochebed birthed him but it was Miriam that orchestrated his survival. Who are you passing the torch on to this morning church? Passing your legacy to, passing your wisdom to, who are you raising up in the kingdom of God, in your family or in your community? Furthermore, who will you allow to help you? You see, God will send exactly who you need in the times and trouble. And he'll be willing if you are willing to receive the help. They may be younger like Miriam, inexperienced like Miriam. They may not look like who you had in mind. It was for Jochebed, it was her daughter. But for you, it may be a stranger, it may be a friend, it may be someone in your community. But when God sends you your help, you have to give him praise. Because he will send who you need. He will send what you need when you have the courage to trust his, his, his way. So you have to understand that for this family, raising the next generation was cyclical. It was Jochebed who passed on the torch to Miriam. And then Miriam who passed on the torch to Moses. And so as you all are leading and growing and thriving in Christ, who are you raising up to lead this next generation? Who are you bringing to Christ? Who are you praying for? Who are you encouraging in times of darkness like today? Jesus had his disciples. Elijah had Elijah. Moses had Joshua. Naomi had Ruth. And how can you be a person that pray and cover over this next generation? Uh, there are boys and girls in need of Jesus. There are generations lost and confused who do not have faith. There are people that are depressed. There is cyberbullying, adults losing their jobs, sickness, identity, confusion. You still don't know who God is calling you to today? How about churches that are closing? Millennial 
individuals who are choosing brunch over the Bible, increased killings, global warming, a deficit of Adderall because the world cannot focus, the homeless, the lonely, the sick and shut and all of these are people that God are calling us to this morning, Christ Church. So how will you pass on the torch to the next generation? How will the church and the world be changed because you were here? Because people like you are raising up brothers and sisters. People like you are giving glory to the name of God where people are saying Christ is now irrelevant. But it is you who are the light in the world of darkness that are saying God is still supreme. So we must be guilty this morning, church. Guilty of reminding the community that Jesus still sits on the throne. Guilty of being a light in the world of darkness. Guilty of praying for the left out and the lost. Guilty of worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no matter what obstacles come our way. Guilty of calling on the name of Jesus in the midst. And oftentimes in the court of law, when you confess of being guilty, they give you a plea deal. They try to give you a lesser sentence. They try to dangle lower charges over your head. But be encouraged this morning, church, because God is saying, don't worry about bargaining with the world. When you are guilty for the kingdom, I'll give you life. Not life in prison, but life more abundantly. Life where you are the head and not the tail. Life where you are above and not beneath. Life where you are the lender and not the borrower. Life where the weapon may form in your life, but it will not prosper. Life where his rod and staff will comfort you all the days of your life. Life where the enemies of your life will be defeated. Life where Jehovah Jireh will provide. Life where there is peace that surpasses all understanding. Is there anybody in this church this morning that is excited to serve life with Jesus? A life of healing, a life of purpose, a life where you are under the protection orders of our Lord and Savior. So call me guilty this morning of choosing God over Pharaoh. Call me guilty of knowing my origin and who God has created me to be. Call me guilty of out strategizing the enemy. Call me guilty of raising up the next generation. Call me guilty of having faith when my back is against the wall. Call me guilty of trusting God over that diagnosis because I know that Jesus will back me up. I know that he will comfort me. I know that he will protect me when the enemy is trying to come against me. So this morning, church, when the times get tough, call on the name Jehovah Jireh, the Alpha and the Omega, the great I am, the lily in the valley. Call on the one who also had trumped up charges against him in the court, but was not defeated because when he raised on the third day with all power in his he said, I don't care what the law say, I am your God. I don't care what society is trying to do against you. I am your God. I can resurrect the dead. I can bring forth life. I can give you new life. When you plead guilty to loving unconditionally, serving fervently, and not allowing the Pharaoh of your life to speak louder than your God. So this morning, church, I have a question. What will you be found guilty of in this season? All right. How will you glorify the name of God? And how will you be unafraid when the enemy tries to intimidate us out of our purpose and calling as the body of Christ. Amen. 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 And amen.